Hi, may God bless us all today. Last time we discussed about stoichiometry based on the formula of the compounds and based on the balanced chemical reaction. I hope you answered the questions or the assignment that I gave you as your exercise number one about stoichiometry. Today, we will open a new chapter that is on solutions. Now, what is a solution? A solution is a homogeneous mixture composed of two or more substances. When we say homogeneous mixture, this means that the substances in the mixture are evenly distributed throughout a single phase or throughout the system. Furthermore, it means that the atoms, the ions, and the molecules are thoroughly mixed such that each part of the mixture has a uniform and similar properties. A solution is composed of a solute and a solvent. The solute is that substance which is being dissolved in a solvent. And the solvent is the dissolving medium. For example, in the solution of sugar and water, the solute is the sugar and the solvent is the water. Let us discuss today the types of solution. The types of solution can be classified according to number one, based on the phase or the state or the form of the solution. Two, based on the dissolution of the solute in the solvent. And three, based on the amount of the solute that is dissolved in the solvent. So let's go back to number one. When we say the type of solution that is classified based on the phase or the state or the form of the solution, we have the solid, the liquid, and the gaseous solutions. For the solid solution, the final state or the resulting state is a solid. And you can see this in the alloys. Now, what is an alloy? An alloy, by the way, is a mixture of two or more different kinds of metals. Now, in the alloy, like bronze, this is a combination of copper and tin. Now, where can you see the bronze? The bronze is what we are using for electrical wiring. Another is the brass. Now, the brass is a combination of or a mixture of the copper and the zinc. Now, where can you see the brass? It is used in musical instruments. Then we have the steel. The steel is a homogeneous mixture of iron and carbon. And there is also what we call a stainless steel. Like for example, you have the spoon is a stainless steel. You have the knives which are made up of stainless steel. And this stainless steel is a homogeneous mixture composed of the iron, the carbon, nickel, there is also the addition of manganese and chromium, in which the chromium here is added to make it stainless. So those are some examples of a solid solution. Let's go to a liquid solution. Now, its final state or the resulting state of the mixture here is in the liquid state. So for example, you have the mixture of a liquid and a liquid like ethyl alcohol and water. So the solute here is the ethyl alcohol and our solvent is the water. If you're going to mix these two, this will give us a homogeneous mixture. Then we have also a solid and a liquid like the sodium chloride that is being mixed with water 
So we have the sodium chloride solution. We usually call this the brine solution or the saline solution. We have also the gas and liquid, just like the carbon dioxide and water. So you have it there, uh, liquid solution. The liquid solution is of two forms, depending on the kind of solvent that is being used. Now, if the solvent is water, then that solution is called an aqueous solution. For example, you are going to dissolve the sugar in water, so you have it there as sugar solution. It is an aqueous solution. Or if you have the copper sulfate dissolved in water, so you will have also an aqueous solution of copper sulfate. But if the solvent is not water, so this liquid solution is called non-aqueous solution. For example, if you are going to dissolve the salicylic acid in alcohol, so the solvent there is alcohol, you have the salicylic acid which is non-aqueous. Or if you are going to dissolve the sulfur in carbon tetrachloride, so that the solvent there is the carbon tetrachloride which is not water. So you have the sulfur solution. So those are the two types of the liquid solution depending on the solvent that is used. Then let's go to the gaseous solution. A good example of this gaseous solution is the air. If you are going to consider the air, there is 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. And if you are going to look at the composition, oxygen is in a lesser amount, so it is considered the solute while the nitrogen is in greater amount, so this is considered the solvent. So, the air is an example of a gaseous solution. Then, let's go to the classification of solution based on the dissolution of solute in the solvent. We can classify this solution as two, unsaturated, saturated and supersaturated solution. When we say an unsaturated solution, this is a kind of solution we're in. There is a small amount of solute that the solvent can normally dissolve at a given temperature. That means the solvent can accommodate more of the solute. It has yet the capacity to dissolve more. Another is the saturated solution. For a saturated solution, this is a kind of solution we're in. It contains already the maximum amount of solute that the solvent can normally dissolve at a given temperature, meaning that is already the maximum amount of the solute that the solvent can dissolve, no more than that. And you have the supersaturated solution. In the supersaturated solution, this is a solution that contains a lot of the solute wherein the solvent can no longer dissolve at a given temperature. Meaning, if you are going to add more of the solute, then this solute in excess will recrystallize. So it is in the supersaturated solution that recrystallization of the solute can occur. So those are the types of or classification of solution based on the dissolution of solute in the solvent. Let's go to the third classification of a solution that is based on the amount of the solute added to the solvent. We have one, the dilute solution, and the other one is the concentrated solution. When we say dilute solution, this contains a little amount of the solute and a large amount of the solvent. But when we say concentrated solution, of course this contains a large amount of the solute and present in the solvent. So those are the classification of solutions based on 
the amount of solute that is dissolved in the solvent. Another topic that I'm going to discuss today is about the enthalpy of solution. When we talk about enthalpy, this means heat. It implies heat. Now, what is enthalpy of solution? Now, the enthalpy of solution is the amount of heat that is released or absorbed during the process of making the solution at a constant pressure. To understand better what are the processes involved in the enthalpy of solution, it is better to think of the hypothetical three-step process when a solute dissolves in a solvent. Let us consider the solute to be substance A, then the solvent to be substance B. And our product, let's call it AB. Now, these three processes or steps involves, number one, the breaking of the substance A, number two, the breaking of the substance B. Number three is the combining of substance A and B producing the product. Now, let's go back to step one. For step one, there is the breaking of the solute. Now, in this process, this deals only of the solute A or the substance A. In this step, this involves the breaking of the intermolecular forces that bind together the solute. So this means, because the intermolecular forces are to be broken, this means that the solute molecules are to be separated from each other. And this is termed expanding the solute. For example, in the solution of salt and water, the sodium chloride is the solute in which in the process of solution the sodium chloride is broken down into its ions like sodium and chlorine. In the process of breaking the sodium chloride there involves an endothermic reaction because it requires heat in order to separate the sodium chloride into its individual components. Number two is the breaking of the solvent. In the breaking of the solvent, this is similar to the breaking of the solute anyway, wherein the intermolecular forces that binds together the solvent will be broken down. This means that if the solvent is water, then the water will be broken into hydrogen and oxygen. It requires again heat energy in order to break water into its components. So this is an endothermic reaction. This process in which there is the breaking of the solvent into its components is termed expanding the solvent. The third step is the combining of the two substances together. In this process, the solute and the solvent combine, meaning the separated molecules of the solute will combine with the separated molecules of the solvent. And this enthalpy of solution is designated as delta H sub 3. And in this process, it is an exothermic reaction in the sense that there is an energy release as the solution is formed. Now, to determine what is the enthalpy of the solution in the process of combining the solute and the solvent, the formula to be followed is delta H of solution is equal to delta H of solute plus delta H of solvent plus the delta H of the combined solute and solvent. Usually, in the process of separating the solute into its constituents and separating the solvent into its components, there involved an absorption of energy. However, when this solute and solvent are joined together or combined together, 
there is an energy released. And because there is the absorption of heat during the separation of the solute and the solvent into its components, there is what we call an endothermic reaction. And this has a positive value. However, when there is the release of energy, then the enthalpy is having a negative value. This time, let us have an example of the determination of the enthalpy of solution. For example, find the enthalpy of solution when you mix the hydrogen and the fluorine to form a hydrogen fluoride mixture. Suppose that the enthalpy of the hydrogen is given to be 436 kilojoule per mole and that of the fluorine is 158 kilojoule per mole, forming the solution, which is hydrogen fluoride, with the enthalpy of negative 568 kilojoule per mole, and the enthalpy of hydrogen fluoride is negative 568 kilojoule per mole. So how do you solve the problem? You simply have to add the delta H of hydrogen plus the, plus the delta H of fluorine plus the delta H of HF. So take note that in the chemical reaction, there is the formation of two moles of HF. And because there are two moles of HF which are formed, then you have to multiply also the delta H of HF by 2. If you're going to sum up the three enthalpies, so you have the result, the enthalpy of the solution is negative 542 kilojoule per mole. So what does this indicate? That when the enthalpy is less than zero, this means that the reaction is non-ideal because the result is less than zero. However, if the result for the enthalpy of solution is equal to zero, then we call it an ideal solution. But when the enthalpy of the solution is greater than or less than zero, then it is called a non-ideal solution. In our example today, the solution is a non-ideal solution. So those are all for today. The two topics have been discussed. The types of solution and the enthalpy of solution. I want you to read about the colligative properties of solution. And I want also to remind you that on Monday, we're going to have our first quiz of all the topics that we have covered chapter 1, chapter 2, until the enthalpy of solution. So that would be all for today. This is your teacher, Professor Nisitas Ruiz of Holy Name University.